ça qu'on rentre, c'est une. Voilà. Je pense que le batterie, voilà. Ouais. Wesh Ok, uh, so, <coughs> hello everyone, uh, to this talk on composable components, uh, that's composable UI components, so we're talking about user interfaces um, in the modern uh, style, such as with things like React or Angular or these sorts. <coughs> My name is as this other guy just said, Markus Schlegel, and I'm a software architect at Active Group. Now, <clears throat> as for my motivation, what do I want to talk about? Well, composition. Well, don't we all want to talk about composition? And of course, I want to talk about reuse. And well, to, pre to be absolutely precise, I don't want to talk about composition and reuse, I want to talk about composability and reusability. There's a slight difference, I hope um, that will be clear during the talk, will become clear, that is. Now, there's a lot of talk about composability and reusability and composition and uh, reuse, but I think there's an underlying concept that's not talked about that much, which which is that, well, code changes. And so there's movement of code. And just like saying it like that, it sounds obvious. Like we all know that code is not a, like there's no static project that's ever done, right? Um, but I don't think we uh, always um, get all the consequences. Uh, that w w of what that means, right, of the movement of code. And so I want to uh, be a bit more explicit on that during my talk. <coughs> now, to drop a <laughs> small Karl Marx quote on you, um, this is a quote from uh, the first volume of Capital, where Karl Marx talks about his scientific method, and he's analyzing... Um, well, as you all know, uh, Karl Marx analyzed capitalism uh, with a special method, uh, which he called the dialectical materialism. And he characterizes um, dialectics as, uh, yeah, something by, like this quote. He says that we have to regard every developed form as in fluid mo movement, and therefore take into account its trans transient nature, not less than its momentary existence. <coughs> and of course, this all sounds like totally ob obvious, but um, well, as Karl Marx showed in uh, Capital Volume 1, the consequences are not that obvious and they are quite consequential uh, in, indeed. And so I want to take that very same meth method and apply it to code and programming. You might think, well, could, could, could there be any two things further apart than programming and, and, and social relations like in capitalism? And I think, yes. It is quite close, actually, because programming, after all, is also social activity. But to move a bit further to the ground and get a firmer grasp on reality, let's first talk about what I mean with uh, the term composability, um, for the sake of this talk, at least. So as we all know, we're, we're functional programmers, right, at Active Group, uh, especially, and I think Bob Conf uh, shows that <laughs> we like to talk about uh, functional programming with others as well. So, uh, of course, I have to start with a function, and this is a simple, pure function. This is JavaScript, but doesn't really matter what language this is, or what, what the arguments work in any language. So, in, in JavaScript, you define a function like that, and it's got a name, right, it's ink, and it takes a value x and it returns x plus one. So it increments integers. So it's as basic as it, as it can get. But there's not something underneath here, right? So we just we don't just do functions, right? There's usually a problem that we want to solve. 
And the problem behind this solution, which you can see here, is that we want to increment integers. But problems, they have the tendency, at least in, um, in our business, to change. And of course, for the sake of this talk, the problem changes also. We don't want to increment integers anymore. We want to do something similar, but not quite the same. We want to take tuples of integers, uh, so two integers now, and we want to increment them part, like each part. <coughs> and as you can see, I added something to the slide in the middle, and that's a new snapshot of our code base. And as I said, I want to draw attention to the movement of code, and that's why I display them side by side, these two snapshots, like the first one that we saw in the beginning. It solved a very specific problem, and in the middle we had to change something, we had to add something, to be precise, uh, to fit the new problem description. Right? The solution has to follow the problem, which is quite obvious. But we can see it does uh, follow the uh, the problem in quite a specific way because we didn't have to change any anything per se we just added something we just added uh, another function <coughs> excuse me another function of course it needs a new name ink tuple and we reused the old function as is so we didn't have to change uh, the old function and that makes sense because the two problems that we had incrementing an integer and incrementing a tuple are there's a well they have a combined like unified kernel inside which is like, incrementing stuff and so um, we would like to follow that property in our solution as well like they, we want to have a common kernel that's not supposed to change much right and that's why we can reuse functions. That's that's what we want to do, right? We want to analyze the movement of code and simplify things in the movement. And of course, we're, we're not done now. Uh, always be composing, so uh, the, the problem again could change slightly, could get bigger still. And uh, well, it's quite a contrived example now, but you get the idea. We still only have to um, have to add something, another function, if if the problem allows um, uh, for such a style. Yes. And that's basically all that's inside of the like that. That's basically all that the term composition of functions um, says, right? You want to combine small functions to build large functions. That's um, that's a common theme in in functional programming. But functions are, well, they're not boring per se, but they're quite well understood, <laughs> I would say. Uh, but we want to have the same benefits uh, that, we, um, that we get with function composition with the composition of other things. And one of the things I want to uh, draw focus in to, uh, on in this talk is UI components, of course. We want to have composable compo components, yes. And so the composition of UI components is simply that, combine small components to build large components. And uh, again, uh, it's important that we not just want to combine them in any way, but we want to combine them without changing uh, the smaller parts, right? ideally, if the, if the problem allows it. And we can have a look at the current state of the art. <coughs> Um, with React in this case. This is uh, a React, they call it function components, uh, function component, and we're using uh, these hooks. Right? The, you, you see this uh, use state, that's called a hook, and that's what makes it not really a function anymore. It, it looks like a function from the outside, function counter, right? But uh, there's stuff going on inside which, uh, which makes them only sort of pure in, in, a, in a very broad sense, so not in a, in a pure functional sense. And now what this counter does is, well, it counts, right? It displays a button uh, with a label that's a number, and when I click the button, then it increments the number, and I can do it again and again. So simple problem again. I think it's 
maybe the, one of the most simplest components you can come up with. And uh, the implementation that you see here is reasonable, right? It, it works, so it uh, fulfills the specification of the problem. Uh, and it's reasonably short, so, well, arguably, arguably you couldn't do much better. Um, so just to go into the details a bit, uh, for those who don't know React uh, that well, uh, so as I said, this use state is a special construct. It basically says that you have a state um, and you can get two things out of this call of use state, which is this, the current state. So uh, React has this idea of a rendering and the state uh, here refers to the current value of the state in the current rendering. And then you have set state, which is basically the write part, writing part of the, the state, so an update. And then you say return, that's a bit strange syntax uh, in, my, in my opinion, but anyway, you, you display a button, like this, this should look like HTML, and you have an on-click handler, and it, uh, on the, in the on-click handler, you call the set state, so the write with the state plus one, so again, you increment, increment a value. And then of course the button needs to display something, so that's this state right here. That's just the current uh, counter value. Now, as I said, this is fine. It's not like it, it fulfills all the needs. But uh, when a problem changes, we get into, well, problems. Because now the diff, uh, like you see, again, the before and after, and I, and I uh, made these little annotations uh, with pluses and, and hash signs. Uh, before with functions, we only had pluses, so we ha only had to add something and what we already writ uh, written down, we could just leave it, like th that was fine, right? But now that's not anymore, that the, that's, that's the, not the case anymore. Because in order to um, solve a larger problem, we almost always have to adapt a solution for the smaller problems. In this case, we want we now want to display two counters, so a counter for a tuple of two integers, and of course we want to we have to add a new component. That's the part down here now. Um, do you see my mouse? Yes. Okay. Um, so that's fine. There's something has to be done, right? Uh, can't really change much about this. This, but this part up here, um, as you can see, a lot has changed. What we did was we made, oh, okay, there's a step in between, I come back, I'll come back to that. What we did was we made this counter a controlled component, that's a term in React, and the controlled component is basically characterized by, well, it doesn't manage its, its own state, it has a value and on change <coughs> prop, uh, so argument passed to it, and it has to, um, display the current value in some f uh, fashion and has to call this on change when, whenever it wants to update its controlled state. <coughs> okay, let's go back to these things. Okay, so the problem statement also includes for, <laughs> again, uh, to make my argument a bit more tight, airtight, is uh, that we want to also display the sum of our tuple values, right? That's going to be here. And that's the reason why we need the uh, use state um, thingy in this larger component, right? If it, if it were down in the uh, small counter component, we couldn't access it, we couldn't compute a sum. So that's why we need the values up here, that's why we need to uh, change things. Uh, the use state is now in the two counters component, and again, we get a state and a set state, and we call them accordingly. Uh, and uh, as I said, the counter has to it has to become a control component, right? There's no way around it. And, uh, well, we use a control component by, well, passing down these two values, value and on change. The value for the, for the first counter component is gonna be the first part of the tuple, which is uh, referred to by the state identifier here. And the on change is just basically gonna be uh, a shove into the the uh, first com first part of the tuple and the second part stays the same. So uh, this basically this this says it stays the same, right? And uh, we get a new xx, so a new updated uh, first part, and we just put it 
uh, where it belongs. And the same, but sort of mirrored is happening in the, in the other counter component. So we can place two counters here, <coughs> pass them their appropriate uh, values and we're, we're done, right? But we had to make this up here a control component in order for this to work. Um, but it's getting worse and worse, <laughs> the larger our programs uh, get. So uh, we're not done yet, of course, always be composing. There's uh, now this contrived two two counters, which we like. We want to use the two counters for that. So we have a tuple of tuples, uh, I should say that, tuple of tuples. Um, but we can't because it's not a control component. We have to make that a control component in order to use it. And so the diff looks really, really bad. We have to change a lot of stuff. And uh, now my face is in a way, but uh, <laughs> I highlighted these lines again. You can uh, see that what we do whenever we, whenever we use a control component is a bit uh, were cumbersome there's a lot of like it looks a bit dense even though what we do is when i want to describe it in words like in simple words it's really easy right we want to sort of focus on the first component of a tuple here in this part and we want to focus on a second part of a tuple uh, down here and uh, well focusing means take the value um, of, of the first part uh, and when you have an update, well, you, sh you put it in the first place, uh, uh, in the first, yeah, part, right, and in the second uh, uh, accordingly. Now, uh, whenever, like, whenever we we have a lot of complicated uh, code, and we are able to verbalize. Uh, what's going on in s much simpler terms uh, in functional program programming that means it's a cold code smell because we have all these uh, great tools at our hand to not have to verbalize like uh, and, and and write it down in a comment or write it in a readme or tell it like uh, via speech to a coworker. we can just write an abstraction or write something down that captures the essence of what's happening here. And that's what we are now gonna try to do. And in order to be able to do that, we need to talk about lenses. Uh, I already alluded to, maybe you noticed two lenses by saying we need to focus on a specific part of a larger structure. That's basically what lenses do. Um, I tried to uh, visualize what lenses do in uh, well in this picture right here so you see an arrow pointing from a larger structure into a substructure of this large structure and this arrow is what uh, like so, uh, represents a lens what a lens does you can think about a lens as an arrow it's not quite uh, right if you uh, get like if, <laughs> if you think more about it but uh, for for the sake of this uh, talk, you can think about it as a simple arrow into into something. And a store you might not be familiar with, especially because uh, I think I made that term up myself. And uh, well, a store for me or for my, for for this talk is a lens plus a large data data structure packaged together, right? So um, so in this case, this orange arrow. Uh, packaged together with this blue larger pentagon, I think it is. Uh, that would mean you have a store. And lenses allow for, well, sort of reading and writing, and they compose, and so our stores follow the composition and semantics of lenses roughly. And, and so they, I, so hopefully, they also compose in the end. <coughs> um, in order to make them, well, worth anything, we need a few operations uh, on our stores. And the first one is a simple read and uh, try to visualize it again with these shapes. Read of such a store is just the part that's pointed to in the larger structure, right? So read would give you the smaller square in this case. 
<clears throat> excuse me. And as the uh, headline suggests, there's also writing. So we have an overhaul function which takes a store and returns a store, but not like it's almost the same store. Um, the, the output is almost the same store as the, as the input, except uh, for the part that's pointed to by the lens. That's uh, replaced by a function that we also um, uh, put into overhaul. So uh, the function maps a maps the square to a, to a star. And so the output is the larger structure as is, but uh, the, 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 the arrow now points to a star. So there was a replacement going on. And uh, it's not just reading and writing, it's composable reading and writing, so we need a combinator. And the combinator that, that uh, we, need, we want is, um, is basically a lens composition, sequential len lens composition. So um, imagine a lens, as, again, as, a, as an arrow. You can just take two arrows and uh, put them end to end, and uh, they, they form a larger arrow that's well, just the path these two arrows follow. And again, a little visuali visualization. We have uh, an orange arrow pointing at some uh, structure inside a larger structure. And then we have a, uh, what is this? Uh, uh, red <laughs> uh, arrow that's pointing again at an even larger, uh, even smaller structure inside this, um, uh, this square. And so if we, if we say if we want to focus this store with this smaller uh, lens, then we get a, another store that's basically the old one, but with a uh, lens composition going on inside of it. <coughs> and now we want to try out our uh, new notion of lenses and stores. We write a little very, very tiny library with this idea. And uh, I didn't. I, I, I can show you, but it's really bad and <laughs> only like 20, 20 lines. Uh, instead, we want to just look at an example, like how would we use such an API uh, that's based on the idea of stores and lenses. And again, we have this problem of the counter. We want to have a button that's uh, displaying that, that displays a value, and whenever we click it, it's going to be incremented. And um, with a new, new idea of the uh, stores and, car and, and lenses, the implementation would look like something like this. Now, first of all, we have to have a uh, convention, or what is it called? Like, uh, we have to agree on something in, the, in that we now need to have stores passed as uh, an argument to every component that we want to write, right? And that's going to be well, this store keyword right here. And this store now represents a value that the component is about, right? So you can think of uh, a UI component as managing some data. Um, and the data is in this case represented by the store. A UI lets uh, the user read or well look at the data and it also lets, it, lets the user manipulate the data and that's uh, what we do here with the uh, overhaul and read right so instead of you uh, as before we were calling set state and and um, yeah calling set state for example we now use our overhaul or with the store that we're given and uh, and the function that increments uh, an integer right in this in this uh, on-click handler right here. Oh, my mouse. Oh. In this on-click handler. <laughs> and displaying the value, well, we already learned that you can get to the act, uh, current um, value of a store by calling read. Now, oh, as we saw, read store, overhaul, store, and a function. And now we want to change the problem again, right? We had a single counter, single integer that's going to be incremented. And now we want to move to a larger problem. That is two, two counters for a tuple of two values. And now, of course, the diff looks much better 
because this counter that we wrote in the first installment was already composable, right? Because we followed uh, this one convention, is that a right word? <laughs> of passing a store object and uh, well, we couldn't do anything else than overhauling or reading with it. So we did that and that already makes it composable. And we see why that is when we look at our combinator, of course, the focus function. Uh, in that for the two counters um, component, we of course also get a store, right? That's, uh, that's our rule. Now this store it represents the value of the two counters component. So it doesn't represent a single integer, it's, it represents a tuple of two integers. And so we can't just pass this store down to the two counters that uh, counter button components that we want to display. That would be wrong, right? They would like read something and display a strange tuple that would maybe work, but this update of x, x plus one doesn't make a sense for two, uh, doesn't make any sense for tuples, right? So we have to manipulate the store that we're given in some way. And the only way we can uh, transform stores is our combinator. And so we call our combinator and well, what do we want to do? We want to focus on a specific part. And this right here must be a lens. So I, I invented some, some lens library here. And the lens library, uh, it comes with a, a set of standard uh, lenses and this standard lens right here it's 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 a lens into an array structure so into a this the, the zeroth component of an array in this case so we just focus on this part and pass down the store that's falling out of uh, this function invocation and then the other uh, installment we just use a different lens right we want to focus on the second part of the tuple so we use a different lens slightly different lens <coughs> and pass uh, the result down to the other counter and this works right if you have the uh, the proper uh, library behind there and we're also not done of course always be composing there's uh, an even larger problem probably waiting around the corner and if the problems do have a common kernel then in this style you hopefully don't have to change much uh, again. <clears throat> so in summary, composable components, what did we do here in this talk? Well, we kept an eye on the movement of code. Uh, that was sort of our method. I didn't uh, uh, go into the details during the later part of the talk uh, much, but we always saw that we had these different snapshots of the same code base we could say and the interesting parts uh, happen in the in the diffs in the yeah in the diffs between two snaps snapshots and i think we can only really understand what what software engineering is if we think about the movement of code and not just of static like give me a to do mvc implementation and i can only tell you like some minor uh, like some minor details about it, but you, you should give me the progression of a to-do application in order for me to judge, uh, to be able to judge if, uh, if the underlying uh, programming model is, is compositional or not, or is adequate or not. Uh, then composability allows for lossless reusability. That's sort of a, uh, what we, like, uh, what our method told us by looking at uh, a certain instance of um, a part of programming, which is yeah, well, UI component <laughs> front-end programming, quite a, lot, a large part these days. And uh, well, in, the, in, in this specific case of UI components with React, we notice, notice that controlled components are composable. That's quite nice. Um, and they're therefore reusable. But they're sort of cumbersome and they don't really express the essence of what's going on. You have to always pass down these value and unchanged thingies. Uh, they, they obviously have to uh, fit together, right? You can't just do completely random stuff there. Um, but this controlled component style doesn't allow you to express the essence of what's going on. 
And that's what lenses and in this case stores are for. They allow for lossless composability as these control components do, but they don't have this uh, contrived like uh, cumbersome whale around, uh, around them. And that's basically all I wanted to tell you, uh, except here's a little to-do list for you. Uh, this talk is sort of based on a on a very old idea by Cornell Elliott. I think this talk that I'm uh, that I link to right here is from 2006 or something. Uh, and Cornell Elliott, uh, well, he argues that components, or in his case, UIs. Uh, graphical user interfaces are tangible values. He, he wants to, uh, well, he, he's interested in what these things are, right? And he argues that they're tangible values and there's a lot of uh, interesting properties falling out of, out of uh, this insight. And, well, if you're interested in JavaScript lens, lenses in, in, or lenses in JavaScript, this is the lens library that I used for this very, very small example. I cannot really say anything good or bad about it. It's just the first that I found that uh, has an identity lens. <laughs> so, uh, right. And of course, the most important one is this thing right here. That's a closure script library, uh, Reactor C. That's um, yeah. That's sort of this idea of composable components taken to the like three three thousand steps more than what I just uh, showed you. Uh, there's a lot more going on there, but the basic idea is the same. So you have these tangible values, you have these composable components, and um, and uh, a lot of reusability falls out of that. Thank you.